thanks everyone for coming. And so we have uh, another roundtable workshop, um, this one on accessibility in the NMR lab. And so one, one thing I'd like to mention since Krish isn't here that um, Krish's next um, research workshop is coming up next week on Thursday the 22nd. And the subject of that meeting is measurement and application of long range and well of J of heteronuclear J couplings. Um, and the panel leader will be Thomas Williamson of the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. So I hope everyone comes for that meeting uh, next week. So um, before we get started, let me turn things over to John. Thank you, Dave. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, as the uh, case may be. Thank you very much for uh, joining yet uh, uh, another uh, Ivan meeting. We're, we're very happy to uh, be able to uh, produce these and uh, uh, provide them. We've got a, uh, a very, very important topic uh, to uh, discuss today. And uh, special thanks to uh, Hillary Jenkins for uh, putting this particular uh, uh, meeting together. Uh, once again, MR Resources is, is very happy to uh, uh, support these. We've been around for uh, 35 years now and providing uh, uh, reconditioned uh, Brooker and Varian uh, MR spectrometers, services and parts and so forth. And uh, I'll also mention our uh, co-sponsor, uh, Q1 Instruments. And uh, we have uh, Donald Bouchard that uh, uh, would like to say a couple of words, uh, if you would, Don. Okay, thank you very much, John. We invite you to get to know Q1. Q1 designs and manufactures complete spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz with features for routine use in the research laboratory. Want to upgrade an older system? Q1 can retrofit AS and ultra shield magnets with complete upgrades, including automation, for less than you think. Q1 offers NMR instruments with excellent performance at an unbeatable price. <clears throat> Experts know the key to the performance is the probe, and Q1 offers smart tune and match probes made by Q1 Tech. Our STM probes have a robust hybrid tuning mechanism, which means faster tuning, unmatched reliability, and improved throughput. Our STM probes are a patented design with tuning that is free from drift and hysteresis for consistent performance, excellent signal and noise, and superior solvent suppression and are made by the renowned Q1 Tech team in Zurich, Switzerland. Q1 Tech is innovated to produce the world's first multi-platform probe, fully integrated into the top spin and VNMRJ platforms. The Q-Link Ethernet-based interface can be installed on a wide range of consoles to fully automate operation of older NMR systems and add multi-nuclear capability to two-channel spectrometers. Q1 Tech also offers custom STM probes up to 600 megahertz, such as this three channel high gamma probe for pharma studies, optimized for tritium observation, providing a wide range of decoupling and correlation experiments. Want to know more about our probes, consoles, and complete systems? Please contact us for a no risk remote demonstration. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, great product lineup. I'll uh, turn things over to uh, Dave Rice at this point. And uh, Dave, if you would uh, get things started for us, uh, please. Okay, let's get started. Um, the, the format of the meeting is the usual format that, it, that many of us are familiar with. Um, Hillary will be leading a panel with five speakers. And generally, uh, pe people will talk until um, uh, generally about 1240 or yeah, 1240. And um, then, uh, and during that time, I'd appreciate it if everyone muted themselves and their videos so we can concentrate on the panel. And certainly feel free to put questions into the chat and several of the panel members will be monitoring the chat to get those inserted in the discussion. And so after the talks are done, then we'll open up for discussion and the meeting can go as long as we keep talking. So uh, I'll get, to get started, Hillary. Thanks a lot, Dave. So uh, today, this workshop is focused on accessibility in the NMR lab. This workshop 
uh, sort of sprang up after we did a meeting in July where we were talking about remote access to spectrometers and, um, and how that sort of compensated for some of, some of the things that uh, you know, we ran into with problems with the normal day-to-day -day operation. It also sprang up because I mentioned that, wait a minute, I can't cure all the time, and that's something that I'm going to be talking about later. Before we get, uh, go any further, though, uh, in, in Canada, it's traditional that before we start a meeting, we uh, begin with a land acknowledgement. And so I'm acknowledging that McMaster University, which is my place of work, sits on a traditional territory of the Mississauga and the, and the Haudenosaunee nations, and that this land is governed by what's called the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And it's a covenant with nature where you take only what you need, you leave some behind, and you keep the dish clean. And this is, um, below that, there's a little bit of an explanation of a land acknowledgement if you've never seen such a thing before. So today, the, uh, the workshop is gonna go with, as Dave said, with five different speakers beginning with Kate Brown from the McMaster Accessibility uh, Office. She's the Accessibility Program Manager, and she's gonna to talk to us about Chemistry Conversations, Accessibility in 2020. Kate's uh, talk is necessarily Ontario-centric, but that doesn't mean that many of the regulations and legislation that, are, that hold in Ontario aren't applicable everywhere else, and in fact, a lot of that legislation is cross-applicable. Blaine Fiss is a PhD candidate in the Department of Chemistry at McGill University, and he's going to talk to us about accessibility in science and moving forward. Clemens Onklin, who many of you know, is the VP of NMR Applications and Training at Brooker Biospin, and he's going to talk specifically about accessibility with NMR spectrometers. Eric Schatzling is the General Manager of Magnetics Incorporated, and he's going to uh, show us a few of the mobility devices that can be used near high magnetic fields. And finally, I will talk to you about hearing impairment and accessibility in the NMR lab. So I will stop sharing and turn the screen over to Kate Brown. Thanks so much, Hillary. Let me just start screen sharing. So uh, to begin, I just wanted to show folks before I start the presentation where we can actually enable live captions in PowerPoint in Office 365 products. So McMaster has a license with Microsoft and this isn't an advertisement for them, but it's a great feature. Under the slideshow ribbon, we can go to this feature, always use subtitles, and I can set these subtitles to come in above my slides. They don't interfere with any of the text. And then when I start to play from the beginning, then you can see that it's starting to pick up on what I'm saying. And it's fairly accurate, just so that folks know this is pretty good captioning as far as automated captioning goes. So thank you for that lovely introduction, Hillary. Um, a little bit of background. I coordinate a program called Access Mac at McMaster University. We're situated in the Equity and Inclusion Office, and a huge amount of my work concentrates on translating provincial and increasingly national legislation within the university infrastructure um, and necessarily involves working with students, staff, and faculty with disabilities, but not necessarily within the realm of accommodations. So my work is much more around community building Building, um, and really trying to figure out scaled out solutions to enable broader accessibility for the campus community. Some goals for the presentation. I thought it would be helpful before we get into the really excellent and nuanced conversations around accessibility that we should probably be operating from a, a few definitions. So what is disability? What is accessibility? Um, provide a bit of a contextualization about what disability representation looks like generally in STEM fields. Um, and then uh, just some snapshots into experiences that folks might be experiencing with navigating academia and STEM fields. Unfortunately, we don't have any time to get into detailed or nuanced understandings of the actual barriers, um, but I think that many of our speakers will speak to that today, which is wonderful. Um, and so I've included a reading list at the end of this presentation, which um, helps to provide a little bit more rich understanding about what some of those barriers and solutions might look like, which I'm happy to share with folks after the presentation. So to begin with, just to contextualize, when we talk about accessibility, we necessarily have to talk about disability because what we're really talking about is facilitating disability inclusion. Um, so I just wanted to take folks to the Ontario definition of disability uh, within the Ontario Human Rights Commission. 
This is actually a policy driven definition that is incorporated within the legal atmospheres, but it's also included within all of the policies at our university, as well as I, I'm guessing all policies within Ontario universities, um, mainly in our accommodations policies, but also in our accessibility policies. And so disability, first of all, is very broad in terms of the definition. I'm not going to read out the exact definition, but it really encompasses any degree of physical disability, um, any degree degree of mental health disability or cognitive or developmental disability, as well as learning disabilities. Um, and also what's been added to this uh, definition in the last few years under mental health disability is severe allergy, so anaphylaxis, as well as um, addiction has been added as well. Um, and so what I wanted folks to be particularly mindful of is sort of the, the interpretation of disability as being interpreted very broadly, uh, but also that there's this interesting nod to what's called the social model of disability, which conceptualizes disability as being impacted by external barriers, um, as opposed to being inherently problematic within the individual themselves. That disability may be a result of combinations of impairments and environmental barriers. So when we're talking about supporting disability and accessibility within our environments, we necessarily have to look to external environments as well. So getting back into the presentation, I wanted to um, provide a particular focus on an area of disability that's maybe not necessarily thought through or thought of when we talk about disability in STEM. And that would be um, what we would call a non-evident or an invisible disability. And so it's, it's not limited to the definitions that I've provided on this slide, including cognitive impairment and brain injury, autism spectrum disorder, um, chronic illnesses and chronic fatigue and pain, um, somebody who may experience deafness or be hard of hearing, blindness or low vision, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and more. So it's not contained to that that group of um, conditional impacts or impairments, um, but rather is broadly interpreted once again. And what I wanted to draw attention to is the fact that the body is always changing. So disability and chronic illness may be unstable or periodic throughout one's life. One might not necessarily always identify as being disabled or having a disability. And so even more so importantly, we have to focus on what we can control when it comes to accessibility and not necessarily focus on individualizing person's experiences and providing individualized supports for those people. We really have to think about how can we modify our environments to the best of our ability in order to enable Enable more universal access. And so then this leads us into a discussion about what is accessibility. The, the definition that's included in a lot of policy, um, accessibility refers to the design of products, devices, services, or environments for folks who experience disabilities. So Ontario has laws to improve accessibility for folks with disabilities, including the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, um, the Ontario Human Rights Code and the Ontario Building Code. But I should also mention, because I know we have an international audience today, that we have excellent legislation available in the States. We have legislation that's available within the UK. Um, New Zealand, Australia. So there's actually quite a body of international legislation when it comes to accessibility and disability. Um, and so I include this image in a lot of my trainings to sort of visually represent notions of equality, accommodation and accessibility in order to promote what we're working toward with the goal of being accessibility. So equality, where we've got the chalkboard, somebody is able to reach it, another person is struggling to the left and then a person sitting in a mobility device can't even reach the chalkboard at all, represents the idea of treating everybody the same as if they're all coming from similar backgrounds and that they all should be considered with what might be determined to be an, an equal process some people equate that with fairness as well by treating everybody the same um, as if they're coming from the same area in their lives. Accommodation is represented in the middle. So we have this little box that the shorter person is standing on and we have a ramp with a platform that the person in the mobility device is able to now reach the chalkboard because we've applied an individualized fix. And so accommodation processes are very common within organizations. They're well established over the past two to three decades. Um, but we can see that as more and more accommodations are needed, especially within very large organizations like a university, 
those systems can become quickly overwhelmed trying to support individualized responses. So for example, in our student accessibility services realm uh, of undergraduate and some graduate students, we currently have over 3,400 students registered with that, that um, service within our undergrad. And I think approximately six counselors that work to support students through those accommodation needs with their faculty members. So then really working towards this goal of accessibility, which I'm hoping that we get to talk more about today, the idea is to modify the environment. So we recognize that folks are coming from different backgrounds, they have different um, limitations, and this isn't just applicable to disability, everybody works within a set of limitations. Um, and so we work to modify the environment, in this case by making the chalkboard bigger, lowering it a little bit. Um, it's a bit of a simplified approach and a, a simplified demonstration of what we're talking about today, but I think it's particularly effective in sort of visually demonstrating accessibility. So then what does this look like within STEM fields? Why are we talking about disabled experiences with respect to STEM fields? I thought I would provide a bit of a snapshot of the literature before we get some very specific examples. Um, so a bit of a macro context, this is within an Ontario uh, and Canadian context, um, but I know it's applicable at, uh, across sort of international realms as well. So the first being that folks with disabilities, Canadians in particular, are less likely to obtain post-secondary educational degrees compared to their non-disabled counterparts. Um, and we also know that the choice of programs and careers are significantly impacted by disability interacting with post-secondary environment. So where there's um, emerging evidence that folks are not necessarily being as impacted in their undergrad, where we're really starting to see it is in a lack of mentorship and support and navigation of accommodation processes that then impact folks going Going into their um, their master's degree or maybe whatever professional schooling they might be going into after their undergraduate degree. Unfortunately, there are no current national statistics on the current number of students with disabilities pursuing STEM fields uh, within Canadian post-secondary institutions, and this has to do with how stats are recorded within student accommodation services. They don't typically collect demographic uh, information related to the, the students' faculty or their program. They're really just recording their classes that they might be in. However, we do have numerous Ontario focus reports in Canadian empirical studies that indicate that disabled students with evident or known disabilities are often discouraged from pursuing STEM in the first place. So that's sort of going from high school into undergraduate. Disabled students entering into STEM fields often experience significantly disabling environmental barriers that prevent them from participating and succeeding in STEM. And the primary barriers that have been identified are not the built environment, they are attitudinal. So what might also be called ableism, uh, which is discriminatory attitudes towards individuals with disabilities, um, are actually more impactful on a student's ability to succeed in STEM than any physical barrier or sensory barrier that we might be currently thinking about. And there's some great information in this article if folks want to read further about some of those experiences. So just to sum up, um, when we're looking at more of a micro context, we have to recognize that attitudinal barriers, the lack of data tracking um, of disability existing in STEM, and also specific to the Canadian context, it's quite different within the American context. There's little funding available in Canada to make STEM environments more accessible. Um, what this ends up resulting is, is that there's very little to no mentorship of students with disabilities entering into STEM disciplines students with disabilities in STEM, and in particular those with invisible disabilities, are not having their accommodation needs met. Um, there's a lot of stigma in the field, not knowing how to navigate the process. Um, and so what this forces students into is either self-advocating for accommodation rights to be met or going without accommodation support, which then makes sense why folks are struggling to, to maintain and succeed within an undergraduate degree and how that might impact them as they're entering into further professional studies. Um, I can also say anecdotally that a lot of the human rights cases that go through the tribunal, the Ontario Tribunal of Human Rights, tend to be coming from STEM fields and they're specific to students whose accommodation need, uh, needs are not being met. So that's a bit of an indication about what might be happening in the field. But I'm happy now to turn it over to um, the wonderful speakers that we have on the panel today to provide a little bit more of nuanced descriptions of their experiences around accessibility and, um, and the field that we're talking about today. Thank you, Kate. Um, we have a couple questions here. Uh, that came through the chat. I guess one of those main questions people have, and I guess I have the same question, mm -hmm. is with a lot of these disabilities being invisible, mm -hmm. um, how do we approach 
students to make them feel more welcome, how do we anticipate them? How do we kind of find out about them so that we can accommodate them? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great and complex question. Um, I think that focusing less on the individual students and more on what can we learn in order to improve and create accessible and welcoming environments is really the approach that we have to take. Um, so some of that might look like advertising in your classes, what accessibility features are currently enabled. So if, for example, if you're operating within a particularly accessible lab space, um, if you've gone to a great lengths in order to enhance the accessibility of whatever you're presenting, especially in a remote environment, it can be very helpful to alert students in particular particular in the course syllabus before the class starts. Just sort of what the lengths are that you've gone to. And then you can also articulate your commitment. So folks have to add a commitment of accommodation in their, um, their course syllabi at McMaster. But additionally, we can add um, commitments of accessibility, which go a little bit beyond the accommodation model. And then if folks need support in terms of figuring out how to make those proactive changes and then how to elicit feedback generally from your student class as opposed to individuals, I'm happy to support that process. It's just that we can get into a little bit of trouble when we're trying to figure out um, sort of more individualized needs outside of the accommodation process, mm -hmm. because then we could have some issues with power dynamic that might happen. Um, and where, despite best intentions, folks might be focusing more on diagnostic um, sort of criteria, focusing more on the student's condition, as opposed to what the functional limitations might be that the person's experiencing, which is why we also promote going through an accommodations process, just for those individual supports outside of the accessibility focus. Really, well, the, um, I have to say that the captioning feature you pointed out in the beginning was fantastic. It's wicked, right? It's the yes. best feature. I, I love it. I never realized how bad my hearing is until I watch myself stare at captioning all the time. <laughs> no, but I think that's true of a lot of folks, especially if you don't speak English as a first language, if you're hard of hearing. There's so many reasons why captions in particular are a very good support. Yeah. Well, Hillary, I guess you want to move on to the next speaker? Yeah, I think I think we should move along. Um, I know there are other questions in the chat that are for Kate, and some of those will be addressed as we go through our next mm -hmm. series of speakers. So, um, but Kate will also be here uh, one, as we move forward. Yeah. So, our, thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, our next speaker is Blaine Fiss from McGill University. So, Blaine, you can take it away. Perfect. All right, well, thanks so much, Hillary, for the invitation. Thank you, everyone. This was a rather uh, sudden surprise, but Dr. Robinstein brought this to my attention, and so I'm really uh, looking forward to being able to share some of my own experiences as a scientist with a disability and how we've been able to actually build on some of the systems um, here at McGill. So a bit of a background on me first and foremost. So who am I? Where am I coming from? Um, I grew up in Kitchener, Ontario, so eventually uh, moved over here to McGill. But my major challenge in life has been that I was uh, diagnosed very early on with spastic diplegia, cerebral palsy. So for those who don't know the specifics, um, spastic referring to uh, spasms and muscle tension overall, and diplegia meaning that it affects two of my limbs, in this case, um, both my legs. So overall, uh, growing up, this has presented me with a couple of different challenges, namely around balance, uh, coordination, as well as some fine motor control as well. And so I wanted to highlight how um, the fact that despite my growing up with this, and thankfully through some surgical um, improvements as well as physiotherapy, I was able to actually get away from using um, mobility aids and now can move more or less independently my challenges still aren't um, completely eliminated, especially in a scientific context. After um, a fairly simplistic childhood, I ended up doing my BSc at the University of Guelph, so moving just up the road a little bit um, and focusing in on nanoscience. And then more recently, I've moved here to McGill and I'm wrapping up the fourth year of my PhD in chemistry um, and hoping to graduate COVID uh, dependent, of course. So I wanted to give two very quick examples about some of the experiences that I've had using NMR throughout my PhD and have actually been able to work in some fairly simple um, but also very effective fixes to things that oftentimes the community doesn't uh, tend to acknowledge. And again, I'm not going to hold that against the community at large. This is something that 
um, oftentimes isn't talked about because meetings like this aren't as common as we'd like to think that they are. So I'm really thankful also that uh, this meeting is being put together in the first place. All right, so um, this photo that I've included on the left-hand side is an updated photo um, of one of our top loading and auto loading NMRs in the department here at McGill. And so um, this is a very traditional sort of scene, right? In a lot of cases with solution NMR, we either have um, loading directly into the probe um, from the top, or we have also these auto loaders which are mounting to the top of the machine itself. Um, and before we had this wooden staircase in place, um, we had the very traditional sort of two-step metal step stool that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And while this works for the majority of the department and the majority of grad students that I work with, um, for me personally, having the stability and confidence to step up on a fairly unstable step stool place my sample into the probe, and then be able to stabilize myself and step back down was not something that I could do with a lot of confidence. Um, and so I brought this to Robin's attention and said, hey, can we come up with something that is potentially a little bit more stable for everyone? And this was the alternative that we ended up coming up with, these, um, these wooden staircases. Um, obviously, this has a lot of added stability over a traditional step stool but is still not a perfect system, right? We're still restrictive towards people with other mobility aids, um, things like wheelchairs and walkers that may not have um, the strength or coordination to actually facilitate moving from one assistance aid to a staircase itself. So I'm not saying that this is a perfect fix, um, but definitely an improvement in and of itself. The other smaller example was that a lot of my um, initial projects in the department involved our solid state 400 megahertz machine. And for those of you that are familiar with um, using these types of machines, as I'm sure a lot of you are, um, oftentimes when we're tuning the probe or when we're inserting the sample, we've got to kneel down or bend down underneath the magnet in order to actually um, be able to access these things. And so this is something that I wasn't really able to do, not necessarily from a comfort standpoint, but just having this ability to either squat or kneel down and manipulate the probe wasn't really working for me all that well. Um, and so eventually what we ended up doing and talking with Robin is simply moving a small plastic chair up against the magnet, something that I could easily move in and out, but still be able to sit in, have a fully stable base, and then be able to lower the probe raise my sample and also tune all at the same time. So these are two very simplistic things that we've done at the department here at McGill. Um, but for me personally, and I believe also for the community at large, have put in, um, have made using these types of machines a lot more accessible and easier for people as well. Um, so overall, I'm, again, this is just a snapshot from my experience. My challenges are very specific um, and there are still other things that I have no experience in um, that I think we can still work towards. And I know some of the speakers today are also going to be touching on that. So I won't go into that in great detail. Um, but things like people with vision impairments or hearing impairments, um, and also those who do need mobility aids. Um, oftentimes, again, we work with these NMR magnets and uh, a lot of people are naturally assuming that mobility aids are made of ferrous metals. Um, or magnetically susceptible metals, and so we have to be careful around these things. Um, so a couple solutions that I think could potentially fix this. Um, the first and foremost, which I think is the easiest, is the buddy system. So a lot of these graduate students and faculty have already developed relationships um, with their colleagues as is, and so um, by having able-bodied colleagues that are able to run the samples for us, or at least um, put those samples into the machines for us is something that I think is easily applicable to um, a large majority of people, regardless of the challenges that they face, be them visible or invisible, but isn't often something that we present as a simple option. So I think um, pushing that forward in our communities is definitely a good fix. Um, the other thing, and I know we're going to have a speaker talk about this as well, which I think is fantastic, um, the idea of waste high auto loaders. So why do we need to necessarily put the auto loader on top of the spectrometer if we know that's already going to be a mobility challenge for even um, in a lot of cases able-bodied chemists as well. Um, and also as we've presented or as I've presented here through my experiences using higher stability staircases for a lot of these top loading machines where 
um, some of these other accessibility uh, means may not be the best option for us. And uh, something I just wanted to close off with, and I'm really thankful actually that Kate highlighted this as well. Um, accessibility ultimately is benefiting everyone. So not just those with visible or invisible challenges, but also those who may not necessarily understand the benefits that those accessibility aids are giving them. Um, this is ultimately, our goal is to make science accessible to everyone, right? So um, for me at least, these small steps are things that we can do to really build up um, ideal labs or as close to ideal labs as we can. So with that, um, I wanna thank you all for your attention um, as well as the ability to even come here and speak. Um, I really wanna thank Dr. Robin Stein for bringing this meeting to my attention, as well as the two groups that I've been able to work with for the past couple of years who've uh, really helped make my experience in science uh, a really enjoyable one. So thank you, and I'll uh, address any questions you might have. Thanks, Blaine. That was uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation, um, and thanks for for sharing that. I really uh, liked that that comment you made at the at the end. It it, it really is important to remember that uh, if we build accessibility into it, everybody benefits from it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you, one other time you mentioned uh, no no one regrets having a, a sturdy ladder to to yep. bring your samples up and things like that. Uh, what one question I have that um, is 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 something that uh, that Kate brought up earlier is uh, can you comment a little bit about any attitudinal types of barriers that you may have encountered uh, during your I, either as an undergrad or, or yeah. graduate student experience? Thankfully, I think for me at least, I've had really supportive uh, groups around me during my career. So both here at McGill, but also when I was at the University of Guelph. There is, I will say this, that a lot of the stigma that I've faced, I think is kind of wrapped in uncertainty. So it's not so much that people don't want to help or are opposed to the idea, but in a lot of cases, I think they just don't know how and don't know how to initiate those conversations of what can we do? What are the faults that you see in our system or that sort of you being the collective, so not just me personally. Um, and oftentimes that just comes down to having honest conversations with people. Um, and I think meetings like this are a really good outlet for that kind of thing, letting people pose questions that they may otherwise be afraid to ask. But I will say that thankfully um, I've been mobile enough and, access and have had enough um, sort of capability in my own right to forego a lot of the challenges that say colleagues of mine in wheelchairs or with, um, with say um, visibility impairments or hearing impairments. So from my, my own personal experience, it's been fairly smooth sailing, but um, a lot of it I think does come down to just um, allowing for those moments to have conversations and say, how can we make these systems better? Okay. Okay, uh, I think at this point we'll we'll move on to the next speaker. So I'll hand it back to Hillary. Thanks a lot, Blaine, and thanks to Bob as well. So our next speaker is Clemens Onkland from Brooker. So Clemens, you can take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hillary, for giving me the opportunity to speak here, and thanks very much to the Ivan Committee of also letting uh, me speak here. So I wanna to talk today about accessibility uh, on the NMR spectrometer. Uh, what is possible, what can we do? Uh, oops, that's, okay, there we go. Uh, what are the possibilities we can do? And if we look at the traditional view of NMR, this is, as Blaine pointed out, samples have to be inserted at the top of the magnet which can be very tall. Sometimes also it's very far from the edge of the magnet to the center of the magnet on a high field system. Then Blaine pointed out the operator need to get close to the ground to operate small, hard to see devices under the magnet in, a strong, in the strongest magnetic field, basically around these magnets. So one of the first um, changes in NMR spectrometer design was the elimination of the fringe magnetic field. 
where a lot of sever, uh, medical devices are affected by these strong magnetic field. Uh, most known, of course, is the pacemaker, but also medication pumps, insulin pumps, aneurysm clips, metallic implants, and so on and so on, are affected by the strong magnetic field. Shielded magnets allow closer access to these high magnetic fields. And in the pictures below, we see the evolution of the five Gauss or 0.5 millitesla lines from unshielded magnets on the left. And this is uh, courtesy of an old Oxford manual, an unshielded. So we have over two meters for the five Gauss line in the radial and almost three meters vertically. And that of course extends above and below the magnet. In a first generation of shielded magnets, this was reduced, cut about in half in both dimensions, made it already much more accessible for people with those uh, devices or with large metallic objects like wheelchairs, walkers, etc. And in second generation or current magnets, this has been further reduced by another about factor of two so that typically for the mid to low field systems, the five Gauss line is within the footprint of the magnet. So that is a first step as the next step um, it is the auto loader or auto sampler, and it doesn't help a lot when it's at the top of the magnet, you still have to climb. So um, devices were designed where the transfer of the sample is at the user level. And there is even possibility of some adjustment. You can put it uh, at a level where it's very convenient for a standing person and feasible for a sitting person or even more accessible for a person in a sitting position. And I also, at this point, I would like to say that a lot of these uh, changes were not primarily designed with accessibility in mind. It was other factors which drove these um, developments, whether it's safety, uh, whether it's space usage and so on and so on, but accessibility was a side product of uh, these developments. Uh, when we go further, and that already was pointed out, you in the past you needed to get under the magnet to tune a probe, to insert the probe that we still have to do, or to adjust magic angle and these things. And over the years, automatic tuning and matching devices have been introduced for the majority of the liquid state probes. So this step of going under the magnet um, has been the uh, eliminated and as of recently we have announced a magic angle spinning probe which has automatic tuning and matching and automatic ma magic angle adjust to also eliminate that step um, of having to go physically under the magnet and I know from probe removal that I have just age related vision I wear progressive glasses and of course my close-up part of the glasses is at the bottom when I'm under the magnet I would like to have it at the top so that's already the difficulty right there. Uh, when we look at the last part of an NMR spectrometer this has to do with the workstation and the software and their most operating system as we see now with this wonderful closed captioning offer various accessibility solutions uh, for disabled users. So if you go into settings of, for example, Microsoft Windows, you will see an entire uh, list of things you can do to make uh, access more, more easy. But this, of course, also applies to the application software itself. If the operating system can do it, but the application system not, it's not as helpful. So for example, can you increase the size of the display? Can you go from a standard display to large fonts and icons, which makes it easier for um, people with visual impairments? And one thing uh, is also another um, item you can do from the software and is, is can, you can you re allow remote access. And of course there are various remote access options, which we now ex use extensively due to the social distancing, um, whether it's remote desktop or team view or no machine and more, or the submission of samples from a web browser or mobile devices directly into the NMR software. But another disability, which is often overlooked is color vision. And I looked it up, it's about 8% of the male population is affected by that. 
and uh, in females it's not as prevalent and there are eight different types of it and you want to have the display in a way that all these people can actually see what is being displayed and if we just take one example here of uh, monochromacy this is complete color blindness you cannot distinguish any colors our standard display of a 2d spectrum in red and blue is obvious to everybody except people with complete color uh, blindness and that same image here from a simulator on colorblindness.com you can simulate what it looks like uh, shows that that's gray and gray no distinction between uh, positive and negative level for example but you can easily adjust for that by choosing different colors here we're looking at the la laker colors purple and gold or LSU Tiger colors, whatever your preference is. And if you turn that into a monochrome image, you can clearly see that this is a better choice because now we can tell the two different directions, positive and negative, from each other. And this is completes my tour of the features which we have done from a manufacturer point of view. Uh, to make NMR spectrometers more accessible to a larger uh, group of users. Thank you very much for your attendance, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Clemens. Uh, always a great talk. Um, I think it's really interesting with Blaine's point about um, how accessibility benefits everyone. It's interesting to see that sometimes safety can generate accessibility uh, accidentally. Um, and it's interesting to know and to see that some of these features in, in uh, Windows and uh, in Topspin are, are there to benefit us, if, even if we're not aware of them at, at first. One question that's come up here is, has anyone managed to get funding uh, for, for equipment on the basis of accessibility that you're aware of? Like, yes. Yeah, I wouldn't know the, exa the exact case, but it has been, um, this has been done. Mm -hmm. I yeah. would also, yeah, Clemens is right, because I know Canada doesn't have the greatest infrastructure for this funding, but actually there's an entire association of uh, disabled chemists that exist in the States. And so there's actually quite a developed infrastructure over the last 10 to 15 years for public funding available to make lab spaces more accessible. I think it, with equipment, it was mostly getting supplemental funding. So you get the funding of the instrument through the standard uh, channels and you get supplemental funding for something like a sample changer uh, through a different, the, um, I basically, uh, well, one thing I abstained from in my talk is talking about that some of these protections are under attack, right? Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. No politics uh, in this meeting. <laughs> Can't escape politics. <laughs> um, does Brooker still sell the sample mail, which was uh, made single sample voting more accessible? In principle, yes, uh, but it has not been very popular in the past. If you can have twenty-four <laughs> minimum, <laughs> so uh, yes, it has been done. We've seen it mostly on instruments which. Uh, like 800s and 900s where samples spend in the magnet like two weeks in the magnet so but you don't still don't want to climb the ladder mm -hmm. oh, and what you pointed out is really important because the safety aspect at a, a rail less two-step step stool from a safety point of view is absolutely dangerous because you're also holding glass in your hand while you're climbing up there so mm -hmm. railings are Railings and platforms are highly important. All right, Hillary, do you want to take back over control? Sure thing. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Clemens and Ken, and th thanks, Kate, for your point as well. Um, Eric, we're going to step down to you now, and you can tell us a little bit about some uh, assistive devices. Hello, I am Eric Schatzlein of Magmetics. Thanks for joining us today to discuss this especially important topic of accessibility in the NMR lab. We've heard from Blaine about his current needs for accommodation and his past need for mobility assistance devices. 
Clemens has told us about how Brooker has worked to actively shield magnets and reduce the magnetic field, and now the five gauss line is less than two feet from the magnet case. People that use wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, or other mobility devices to move around still find it difficult from a safety standpoint to access the NMR magnet, especially older non-shielded magnets. This is due to the most mobility devices being made of magnetic materials, but there are now alternatives. I'm here today to tell you about a few devices that can allow people with mobility assistance needs direct access to the NMR magnet for high magnetic field areas. There is currently available wheelchairs and walkers that are rated for use in seven Tesla MRI scanner suites. So what does this mean? Here we see the typical Gauss line maps for a 7T MRI scanner. The 5 Gauss line is marked in red so that we can see how far it extends from the magnet. That distance is about 24 feet. The 400 Gauss line is marked in green and we can see that it, it extends beyond part of the scanner table as well. If a wheelchair needed to stay outside the 5 Gauss line, a patient would have to walk a fair distance to be able to get to the MRI scanner table. Many users of wheelchairs do not have the ability to walk those distances. But with currently available offerings, there are non-magnetic and non-ferromagnetic wheelchairs and walkers rated to 7 Tesla magnets. These devices can be used to transport or assist patients right up to the side of the MRI scanner table. This means that they are usable in magnetic field strengths above 400 Gauss. What this means for NMR labs? There is now some mobility devices available for close-up use around NMR magnets. It is always best to check the magnetic field and verify where that field extends to, but in many cases, even old non-shielded magnets can now be accessible. If anyone has any questions or needs more information on these other or other mil or other mobility devices, please feel free to contact me at Magmatics. Actually, I think I'll, I'll just uh, I, I'll ask a, a question or okay. two. Um, so, so you showed um, examples of mobility devices, which of course would be uh, very helpful. Um, in Blaine's talk, he showed uh, a custom-made wooden uh, ladder type system with the arm rail and stuff. But is that something that you also can provide so that we have a nice stable platform with, with rails uh, if, if you do still need to climb up high? We do have, uh, we do have the avail availability to get uh, aluminum ladders and uh, platforms similar to what Blaine had shown in, in a wooden format. Um, those are, are available. Um, there's also other, other devices that can get people down underneath the magnet if they need to, uh, similar to what you might see in an automotive shop. Um, we can get somebody a, 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 uh, a device that they can lay on to get down underneath that uh, uh, magnet to do what they need to do. Any other questions? I, uh, I don't see any other questions at this point, so I'll hand it back to Hillary. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Bob. So it's my turn to talk. I do have, cap I do have closed captioning as well, yay. So I'm going to talk to you today about hearing impairment, and I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about overall accessibility in the NMR lab. So I'm gonna start just very briefly to remind us about verbal communication. We need to always communicate clearly with each other and our users and our clients and our, um, you know, all kinds of people, both via Zoom now, we're spending a lot of time on Zoom and Microsoft Teams and other sort of platforms. And also though, we are spending some time uh, meeting people one-on-one, -on -one, maybe not nearly as much as we're used to, but that is happening as well. So it is important that people speak as, in as much as it's possible, clearly and slowly, that we look at people when we're talking to them, we wait for others to finish speaking, which I have to admit is a problem for me sometimes. When we're doing pre-recorded instruction, we can include closed captioning, and obviously we're using that today as well. And thanks to everybody for chipping in on this. Um, keep in mind too that if you're doing uh, a lot of presentations, 
that your institution or university will probably have provided supports to people who are new to online teaching. And this is, these are available to staff as well, especially if you're doing a lot of online training. So maybe look into that. And the reason I'm talking about verbal communication first is because I am a person who is hard of hearing slash hearing impaired. I'm hearing impaired in the NMR lab when I have to remove my hearing aids. So honestly, I wasn't going to talk specifically about me. And I realized uh, that I didn't want to do it because this is actually a difficult talk for me to do. Uh, I lost my hearing in my mid 20s, which was, or started to really lose my hearing in my mid 20s, which was actually quite a while ago, almost 30 years ago. And so this was a, it's a different time when we're talking about disability and accessibility. And so I was in the middle of grad school and, and my hearing started to decline quite rapidly. There's no explanation for this, by the way. I don't know why I lost my hearing. Uh, some people say, it, or some of the audiologists have said it's genetic. And, and that's all I can tell you. I can tell you though that when I was, that asking for help was impossible because I didn't actually know what was happening or what was wrong. Um, I do know that I was blamed for not hearing things both at home and at work and that was pretty unpleasant um, because nobody, because we didn't know or I didn't know and then people started to say, well, you can't hear and I couldn't believe that that was actually true. It, uh, as things progressed, I started to miss a lot of important detailed conversations, and this then reflected back on me being sort of labeled as, you know, not as smart as everybody else because I didn't understand everything that everybody was saying all of the time. And again, I have to admit that I denied the idea that I was, that I had possibly lost any, any of my hearing. I did know, though, that I had a little bit of a problem because when I was in a meeting situation, I couldn't understand when people were asking me questions. But if I asked someone to, if they could, you know, repeat the questions for me, so I would have maybe one of my colleagues, I asked them once if they would mind standing or sitting near the front and repeating the question. And they took that to mean that I didn't understand the question and that they would have to answer for me. So um, this attitudinal, uh, um, you know, ableism, I guess, was really prevalent but you know honestly I didn't know what was going on and I didn't know that I really had a problem until I finally had my hearing tested when I was about 28 years old. At the time I was told also by that audiologist that they couldn't help me because there were no digital hearing aids that helped you just hear the high higher frequencies. They were just hearing aids that not magnified everything and it would have driven me nuts. However by the time I was a postdoc I was able to get new hearing aids and honestly getting them was revelatory because I had no idea what I was missing. Now, I honestly wasn't, wasn't going to show you my hearing, the results of my most recent hearing test. However, here they are. Um, a normal, normal person in quotation marks usually hears everything most in this range, the 10 to 20 decibel range. However, you can see that Hillary does not hear that. Hillary's hearing tends to uh, degrade really quickly. So right around 750 Hertz, or even 500 hertz, I'm losing a lot. I've got to have things turned up to 30 decibels in order to hear at that range. And you can see as we go along that it degrades and degrades so that down, or when we get to higher frequencies, I've got to have things up to the 80s, well, 60 to 80 decibel range in order to hear them. I'm lucky that hearing aids work for me. They don't work for everybody who has a hearing problem. And so sometimes people are, uh, hearing impaired, and there is no solution for them. Um, I also am very privileged that uh, we have a really good benefits plan at McMaster, and so the uh, current hearing aids that I have in my head I have all kinds of um, have all kinds of accoutrement, I guess, and uh, and they were a whopping six thousand dollars. But as I said, with a really good benefits program, I was able to afford them. So. Like I say, I'm hard of hearing with the hearing aids in. I'm hearing impaired when they're out of my head. I have to take them out when I'm under the magnet, for example, or doing nitrogen or helium fills and that kind of thing. 
So in the lab, like I say, I have to remove the hearing aids and we're all wearing masks because hello COVID. So at McMaster, everybody has to wear a mask in every public, um, every public area. And we include the NMR facility as being a public area. And so when people are wearing masks and I have my hearing aids out, I absolutely cannot understand a thing they're saying to me. They can yell um, or you know, uh, try and talk louder. I find it's more embarrassing for them to talk than it is for me to ask them to repeat. And I have had it happen that some people will just avoid talking to me um, because it's, it's too difficult for them to keep repeating themselves. My good friend Robin Stein, however, went out and purchased uh, a mask with, um, with a transparent area over the mouth. And while it isn't particularly enhancing to uh, <laughs> for her it gave me I have to say such a huge feeling of relief to be able to see someone's mouth and to be able to um, to uh, read lips when they were talking so this something like this makes a massive difference for somebody like me I want to point out sorry and I meant to earlier that uh, when I was first told that I couldn't get hearing aids, I decided that I had darn better learn how to read lips so that I could understand what people were saying to me at the very least. So something like this is um, um, really helpful for somebody like me. The thing is, it's not the most comfortable thing for the wearer. Now, if we think about safety, when you've got someone in the, in the lab who is hearing impaired, uh, what we've done is we've made sure that our fire alarms all have uh, flashing lights associated with them. So if the fire alarm goes off, if I hear the loud sound I, or I feel it, I don't really hear it if I've got my hearing aids out, but I see the flashing light and so I know that I should get out of the lab. We've also established a buddy system. So Megan and Bob will text and email me to make sure that I'm out of the lab or that I'm, or to find out where I am. Other things that are sort of day to day is unusual noises. I don't notice the way people who can hear properly do. So I'll walk into the lab and maybe there's an unusual noise, but I don't identify it that way. But Bob walks into the lab and he's, he's immediately on guard because he can hear something that I don't understand as a, a noise that's different. Other things that are you know normal day to day for me, I don't hear on the phone all that well, except for my own phone because it's Bluetooth to my hearing aids. Um, and I can't always hear if things fall off the counter, et cetera, et cetera. But most of the people that I know and work with now know that I have a little bit of a problem and everybody is really super supportive and we all do our best. So jumping sort of very briefly to talk about the NMR lab itself, I think that when we, when we as NMR managers and staff um, look at what we have to do day to day, uh, as far as maintenance and operations in our facilities, we have to be very able-bodied people. And what that sometimes translates to is that we don't realize when an accommodation or when accessibility has to be built into the lab because we have to climb up all over the magnets and climb in underneath the magnets, um, you know, haul a doer down the hallway and sometimes those hallways are really long. So, you know, we're doing a lot of heavy work sometimes. So when we think about creating accessibility, first off, try and use the resources at your institution. So look around for an Excel accessibility office and then look at legislation. If you can, if it is possible without asking someone if they are disabled, if you could audit your lab with someone with a disability, they, they'll be able to point out to you better than anybody uh, where they have problems with accessibility and they'll be able to point out to you areas that work really well for them. And somebody has asked where money comes from. Well, um, and Kate pointed out that Canada is a little bit more difficult than the US, but you know, and you don't have to work alone on this look around, talk to the department of faculty, start looking around in um, all kinds of resources. You never know, there might be private funding from donors who would be happy to assist with accessibility. One thing for sure though, it doesn't cost one cent to rearrange the furniture. And finally, your, our best practice I think is just to assume that everybody needs access to everything. So if you assume that uh, you, know, you, need, you want to improve accessibility, and keeping in mind that nobody's under obligation to tell you that they're disabled, 
then you can improve your lab and everybody benefits just like uh, Blaine and, and um, Kate pointed out already. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody today for attending. I'd like to thank the presenters who've, uh, who've helped out with this workshop. It, uh, this is something that, that's really, really important to me. And, um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super grateful that the Ivan Executive Committee were so, um, so strongly behind this workshop. And I, I thank you all today for your attention and for your continued participation as we continue this discussion. Thank you so much, Hillary. That was wonderful. Uh, I think this has been a really, really important uh, conversation today. Just awareness about these topics is fantastic to, to improve it. I know that I, I kind of am one of those people who uh, have been one of those people who enables this by just thinking that it's easier to find another way to have someone else do something for someone rather than provide the access that allows them to do it. So. That's definitely something we're going to work on in our lab. But uh, <clears throat> with regards to your talk on hearing loss, that is a, a disability that I share. Uh, my wife would call it my superpower, um, especially considering I have sort of the reverse hearing loss that you have, which, which actually eliminates my ability to hear her father or my father-in-law. So that is um, very interesting. But... Um, I'm curious about your comment about hearing aids near magnets and how you take them off in the lab. I have to admit that I've never even considered taking them off and I climb under and on and around the magnets all the time and I'm wondering what sort of danger I've been putting myself in. Um, I would, well, let's see. I don't think that you've been putting yourself in any kind of danger. The components within the hearing aids themselves are non-magnetic, it's the batteries. So I don't know if you notice if, yours, if your hearing aids will switch into a different mode when you get close to the magnet. Um, these ones are brand new and I'm a little concerned about my rechargeable lithium ion batteries and I, cause I need them to last for five years cause I really don't want to lay out a whole ton of money again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I talked to our lithium ion battery researcher, they indicated that no, probably getting under the magnet with them in my head is probably not a good idea. That said, my audiologist couldn't confirm. And uh, so I will probably send a note to um, the manufacturer just to double check. So it, but it is, it's the batteries that are magnetic. And so um, that you, you might hear that, you know, a beep beep or something when they go into a different mode when you get near the magnet, but they're probably, you're probably not hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. An older pair of hearing aids uh, I had, um, the batteries used to almost explode when I got under the magnet. And so that, that was part of why I don't wear them in, underneath anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is I had another pair or it was the same pair that had a, a little piece of metal spring, a, what they call the wax catcher that was inside the hearing aid. And that actually uh, got, so I forgot and I went near the magnet and that actually got stuck in my ear, this teeny tiny, yeah, spring. And so I had to go and have that removed and that uh, came very close to having to have surgery. Wow. So I, yeah, so I've had not great experience with wearing them in and under the magnet. Other people's experiences are probably different, but like I said, these ones are, I'm going to double check on the, uh, on the, um, lithium ion battery and see if there's no problem with it. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Don Bouchard who says that he has worn hearing aids for about 10 years and hasn't had a problem with them around magnets, but he does hear the mode change. Right. Um, now, let's see, uh, Robin, actually Kate mentioned that there's another clear mask product uh, available on the internet and uh, wanted to point that out. That's in the chat, www.theclearmask.com. Mm -hmm. And Robin was wondering if anyone has any experience with these uh, as far as like fogging up or muffling of the sound. No yeah, experience. I don't, yeah. <laughs> people may not have. 
Yeah. Sorry, so, I, I did offer a comment. Sorry to respond to that. I was just saying yeah. to Robin that there's tricks to, to making your clear mask anti-fog. I think the ones that I've sent along have been, they're sort of a streamlined design so that there's less fabric along the top and the bottom so that you're not dealing with the same muffled sound that might be coming out of some of the, the cheaper options. These ones were recommended for healthcare workers. So they're kind of like the, the top level design in terms of the, the mask design itself. Okay. Um, but yeah, like I, they were sold out for so long that not a lot of folks have had opportunity to test them within post-secondary environments, but it would be a really great opportunity, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really would. So the uh, last thing I wanted to, to mention is, um, is teaching in this environment of the pandemic mm -hmm. has kind of uh, really been fantastic because we've moved to Zoom and I can hear the students so much better than I could in an open lecture hall. So I'm kind of dreading going back to the classroom environment where they all want to sit in the back of the room. Mm. We're often mic'd, but rarely do we mic the, the students. So I, I, I wonder if, the, if anyone has any comments about that. I mean, Ken, I think you raise an incredible point that is often overlooked around accessibility for staff and faculty members, because I think disability has sort of only been recognized within student realms in the last 20 years, um, but increasingly the recognition that faculty and staff also need to be included in this demographic. And it almost makes me wonder how many instructors that have the opportunity to be a little bit more autonomous in their teaching practices are going to go to a blended learning format once, you know, when and if we're invited back to the campus widespread. I think for the sake of accessibility, but also potentially some outlying, uh, the word trauma is pretty strong, but I think a lot of people are experiencing extreme stress right now related to COVID. I think there's gonna be a lot more opting for a blended learning environment rather than going right back to in-person environments, just because they're not, when we have the opportunity for blended learning, why wouldn't you? There's just so many benefits to doing it, right? Beyond what we can just, like I, I would never argue to take face-to-face -face teaching away entirely. I think it really has great pedagogical benefits. Um, but I also think the reality is, is that we're working with generations of people that have been raised in online environments. So the familiarity is there and it's in some ways easier to engage with students in online environments too, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Hillary, do you want to take it back and maybe open it, open up the discussion? I can do. So, um, is there, John, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, just some, you know, sort of uh, uh, real world uh, experience. Uh, many of you know that uh, I'm a wheelchair user. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I, I've done a great job so far of not uh, ramming the thing into any magnets. Uh, <laughs> So that's a, a, a big plus, but uh, uh, you know, I th things have certainly gotten a lot better uh, uh, over the years, uh, as as we all know. Uh, just a, a, a little piece of uh, uh, a little anecdote uh, uh, from my experience: uh, our beloved uh, EMC conference grounds at uh, Asilomar uh, has uh, maybe people have noticed, maybe not, uh, but over the last uh, uh, two or three years, especially. Uh, have become uh, uh, certainly more uh, accessible for uh, a wheelchair uh, in terms of a number of the uh, uh, steps that go up and down the hills uh, have been replaced by uh, sort of nice uh, winding uh, ramps and so forth. Uh, they've installed uh, uh, several uh, wheelchair lifts and, and uh, what have you. And uh, I, I, I'll admit that uh, I've, I've remarked to uh, the various powers to be uh, here and there over the years and uh, uh, maybe at times not so softly, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, I think it was about three years ago that they, they made some major changes. So uh, uh, all, all for the good, uh, uh, things uh, uh, continue to get progressively better. Thanks a lot, John. Um, there was a question right at the mm -hmm. end here. Uh, if any of us can recommend us any sites uh, that spell out accessibility specifications or um, things that, you know, describe where a white short, whiteboard should be or dimensions for a magnet staircase. And I think the second one, uh, where we've had to bring in um, s scaffolding or platforms to be around the magnet, a lot of times that'll be dictated by the amount of space you actually have. Mm -hmm. So we've got one system where uh, the platform is 
it, it's, um, it's, it's a tight room and you have to climb up. Uh, I had a picture of this because it, it also illustrated how someone who's very tall doesn't have to climb as much as somebody who's very small, which would be me. Um, but yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, that's going to be dictated by the amount of space you have. Uh, and Eric did point out that there are um, solutions to that available as, as well. So, you know, a lot of times those platforms will be custom built. So, you know, you're looking at uh, a fairly big cash layout. Mm -hmm. Now, not for the kind of thing that Robin did, by the way. There's this a wooden one is maybe a little bit easier. I think maybe the trickiest part of answering this question is where, um, at least within the Canadian context, where our legislation falls short is uh, in use of space. So there's quite a bit within the Ontario Building Code around the development of the building, but there's very little at a provincial, if nothing, at a provincial and national level that would dictate how to lay out your space uh, because it's so highly dependent on whatever you're using that space for. So I know as one really tangible example, um, our ISI program, Integrated Sciences program at Mac, they had uh, one student who was a wheelchair user and what the person who was coordinating the lab did, which I thought was really clever, is in engaging with the student who is also a disability advocate, they've taken whatever accommodations that the student required and scaled it out and they scaled it out during the renovation of the lab so the lab was undergoing a huge renovation at that time it's really the opportunity then that folks have to be thinking about how to upgrade your spaces during these major renovations and so I'm going to send the website which um, can give folks a visual example of how they've laid out the lab um, really everything's just adjustable like height adjustable it's well spaced out but I was really impressed because the lab coordinator also paid attention to things like color contrast on the walls and making sure that um, you're not getting too much shine and reflection from the window areas so that somebody who's visually impaired isn't going to walk into a wall right like it, it was just such a great and impressive project um, and I think that he probably was leveraging funds that were inherent to the budget of the of the refurbishment of the lab so not necessarily going above and beyond getting i think the one thing they may have um sourced is this movable i don't even know what the tool does but you can see it in the left corner um, it's adjustable height adjustable so that would have cost a little bit extra money uh, but i think everything else was actually just layout it was moving furniture it was choosing good paint choices it was getting adjustable furniture stuff like that okay that's excellent. Thanks a lot, Kate. Uh, sorry, Dave, do you have anything or? Well, I, I've learned a lot and uh, particularly about ableism, a word I've never heard before, and which is a completely different perspective from how actually the, the, all the talks turned out to be a completely different perspective from my, what I would have anticipated as a uh, more technical discussion about accessibility. Um, so, uh, are, are there other questions from everyone? I wanted to add one thing, um, that a few years ago, our facility had to move and we were under renovation as well. And, um, while we moved into a bigger lab and the spaces, uh, expanded significantly from where we were. Um, other than the fire alarm, because I kept saying, if I don't, I need a light, I need a light. Other than the fire alarm, I have to admit, we didn't think about accessibility very much. We've been lucky to do a big overhaul on a lot of our spectrometers in the last year. And so we have implemented a number of the waist high uh, auto samplers, and it really has made a big difference for a lot of people. Again, you know, a lot, a lot of these things will stem from safety. And so I was just relieved to not have people up on ladders 24 seven, because when people are submitting samples up high on top of the magnets um, and we're not around or not a lot of people are around because the facility is in the basement and we don't get a lot of traffic down there. Uh, you know, anything can happen and, and accidents can happen whether you're able-bodied or not. And so now that those, uh, those changes have been made, it's actually you know, a big relief more than anything else. But yeah, we'd like to open up the floor. So if anybody does have any other questions or any other comments, then please um, 
please go ahead. Feel free to uh, to you know say anything. Otherwise, yeah, we'll uh, otherwise we'll get moving with the rest of our day, I guess. But if you do yeah. have anything to add or questions to ask, well, I'll add um, one thing, and then maybe we can, if there are no other questions, um, and and that is uh, the other two things I was I reminded of uh, from Clemens' talk were the, uh, the sample mail based sample changers and shielded magnets, both of which were Brooker innovations. And uh, I don't think, it, and so I can remember being stunned by them all uh, back 20 some years, more and more years ago. So, um, but with that comment, I'll, um, I'll ask if there are no more questions, uh, maybe this is a good time to wrap up. Oh yes, before we go, let me remind everyone again that we're having a meeting next week on Thursday, the 22nd, about J couplings. And let me give things to John before we wrap up. This, uh, I think, uh, in, in my view, has probably been one of the most important uh, uh, Ivan meetings to date. And uh, I'm certainly uh, very much appreciative for uh, uh, everyone's input. Uh, once again, to uh, Hillary for uh, putting it all together for us and uh, all of our speakers as well. Uh, many thanks. Okay, so thank you, John. Uh, with that, then let, let's call the meeting close. I guess I don't have a gavel. <laughs> <We'll see you. laughs> thanks, thanks, everybody. everybody. Yeah. yeah, that was awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah.